I'm doing well. And your name is? Mary Long. What's your name? Del McAdams. Hey, how you hey, doing? Hey, I got hey, hugs. I got hugs. Who are you?
by your word and spirit. Help us to hear, know, and live the gospel so that we might proclaim in word and in deed the good news that you offer us this day, a message of peace to the whole community and love with faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome to If y'all think I can follow that act, you're wrong. <laughs> That's wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I've never felt more inspired by God as during this group. I will tell you. I do this, I substitute a lot, so I go to a lot of different churches. I will not get up and move around because you may not remember the sermon, but you might remember the thought. <laughs> I would understand Gordon moves around. I got to meet Gordon and Ruby this past couple of weeks. I never get to meet a pastor because I'm always substituting. But I really thoroughly enjoyed my visit with them. First the cat, then Ruby, then you. <laughs> anyway, I'm truly blessed to be here. I feel like I'm echoing from what I hear. Does everything sound all right? My sermon today is God is love. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 21. Now, I don't do a lot with these upper letters. I've never done one, so I, this is a new sermon for me. So please enjoy it, because I put it, <laughs> Charlotte's been on, when I do these substitutes, I put off putting the sermon together I try to, I have weeks to do it. I'm not like a regular pastor that does it every week. So when I start doing it, it was about a week and a half ago. So I didn't get it completed until yesterday. But I want to tell you. But I'm blessed. God's word is God's word, right? Hear now the word of God. Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. And many false prophets have gone out unto the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, and every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is from God, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard in his coming, and now it is already in the world. Little children, you are from God and have conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore they say, if what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever trusts God know, listens to God, and whoever is not from God does not listen to God. For this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. These first six verses show us how the author is testing our spirits as to whether we're hearing God's words or not. I will read the verses that show the rest of the chapter, and the rest of the chapter is called God is Love. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love is, was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to the atoning sacrifices for our sin. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, 
But if we have love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because he is, and so are we, of this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say it, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God, whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let me open with a prayer, please. Lord of all creation, as we open our service, let us be in gratitude to you and all you do for us. In every moment of our lives, from the air we breathe to the healing of our bodies and the world we live in, let us remember it all comes from you. We today grace you with our attention and ask to absorb your message from the scriptures of the service today. May your words be heard today and not mine. We offer praise and, sac and gratitude for your presence in our lives. Amen. I prepared that prayer for the opening of the service, and I like that I didn't have to do it. Oh, everybody feeling good today? We're in God's house. How could you not feel good? And we ask the blessings on the people that are not here or could not be here. Everything we do, it all begins with God's love. <clears throat> in case we, and I apologize for my throat, we, in case we ever forget this basic essential fact of our faith, the scriptures in 1 John make it crystal clear. God is the source and definition of love. God is love. God loves us as the sun shines. His love expresses who God is. First John emphasizes that God's love is not some abreast concept, abstract concept. It is passion expressed in action. God made real and present by sending Jesus to live among us and to die for us. God continues to show us love through Jesus' life-giving presence among us. If ever we should question whether God truly does love us, we should. The gift and witness of the Holy Spirit confirm it once more. We are God's beloved. God's love is a truth more basic and reliable than the ground we walk on or the air we breathe. God's love does not depend on our initiative or our worthiness. We don't have to reach out to God or even believe in God in order to be loved. Have you ever thought about that? God loves us no matter what. We don't have to clean up our act before God can love us. We don't have to measure by some standard in order to be lovable. No. God showers love on us whether we deserve it or not. And honestly, who could ever deserve such an amazing and measurable love? I, First John insists that more fully, completely, that we know God. The more the immense reality of God's love draws, dawns on us, the more we can love God. 
When we open ourselves to the warmth and light of God's presence, we find that even our deepest, darkest secrets and the ugliest parts of us are not beyond God's reach. That really got me. I mean, do we always control our thoughts? No. Does God know our thoughts? Yes. <sighs> Nothing in us is so broken or so filthy that God is unwilling or unable to touch it. God embraces us as we are and loves us as we are and works in us to make us clean and whole and new. By being surrounded by such love, who could be afraid? Who could be afraid? Such life-giving love is too wonderful to keep to ourselves. To know God's love is to overflow with God's love. I see God's love here today. In the congregation, in your church, in the people who volunteers, the choir, and the children. How can we possibly love God and we hate God's beloved? How's that possible? Seeing ourselves as God's beloved means seeing our brothers and sisters as God's loved ones too. If we come to know God's love, as we have seen for ourselves as within God's true family, although God's love is without our condition, it is not without consequence. God commands us to love one another as God has loved us. In case we haven't understood the seriousness of this command, 1 John's expressed it in a way that leaves no room for doubt. In verse 17, he says, Because as he is, so are we in the world. In this context, it's clear that 1 John is not saying that Christians are all-knowing or better than anyone else. I love this one. Or morally pure. We're not morally pure. Number one, no one in 1 John is saying that God, because God lives in us, we embody God's love in the world. Let me say that again. No one in 1 John is saying, nowhere in 1 John is saying that because God lives in us and embodies God's love for the world. We are not gods ourselves, but we are God's possessions. God's love is incarnate in us. Have you ever thought about that? The author of 1 John calls us to love one another, that is to love our brothers and sisters. The first century Christians, this is who 1 John was written for, was originally written to subside the conflict that the early Christians were having about the boundaries of the community about theology and about false teaching. In this context, 1 John focuses on love for others who belong to the community of faith. Does this mean we're called only to love only to love those who belong to our group and believe as we do? No. The whole foundation of 1 John's argument suggests otherwise. If we love others as God has loved us, there can be no boundaries. God's love made visible and present in Jesus. Jesus is the sort of source of the love we share with others. Jesus ignored the limits that religious communities imposed. He ate and talked with people whom the religious leaders had rejected as sinful, as filthy, and despicable. He touched people who were considered untouchable and welcomed people whom everyone else had kicked out. His harshest words were reserved for the impure. Were his harshest words were not for the impure, but for the unloving, self-righteous people who saw some of his God's children as beneath their attention and certainly as unworthy of their love. If Jesus, if Jesus shows us what God's love is like, then there can be no doubt how far our love for others must extend. To every single human being, that's all human beings. 
Such love can never originate with us. It is not our weak, limited love that we share with God's beloved. No, we are called to open ourselves to God's love so that God can love others through us. When we love one another, we're showing God to the world. By allowing the love that God has showered on us overflow into our brothers and sisters to make divine love real and visible in the ordinary lives of ordinary people. God invites us to let Jesus live in us and see so that through us, Jesus can continue to welcome outcasts and touch untouchables and heal the broken. When God's unimaginable, limitless love comes alive in us, we become the real presence of God in this world. All we can possibly say to such love is thank you. The purpose is not to exclude others, rather to support those who likely make difficult choices to belong. In this human experience, we grasp God's self-giving love for us, giving the incomparable gift of salvation and life through his beloved son. Or we might tackle poverty, poverty or hunger in the light of the abundance most of us enjoy. I found out about your food thing that you're putting together this week, past week, or I don't know much about it, but I thought it was very awesome. Or advocate for peaceful resolutions of differences. Do you know what that would mean? I thought about that when I read it. Or advocate for peaceful resolutions of difference. I would really like to be without war. How would we like to be without war? I thought, what an amazing thing that would be. Opportunities stretch from our doorstep around the globe. We might conclude that we're too busy to make our business to judge who is saved or who is condemned. We might instead accept John's challenge to the followers of Jesus and his community as of our own. That is moving outside our comfort zone to make a public confession of our faith. To do what is right is not always an easy choice, but it is God's choice. We must therefore challenge ourselves to push beyond our comfort zone to do new things. I hate doing new things. I'm old. Right? You know, I like to do things that I've always done, right? <laughs> this indeed is... I'm mad losing that one, by the way. As, we, as indeed how we love as Christ loves and as God loves us. Sacrifice can be life or limb, and when it is, it should be honored as such. But it doesn't have to be. Every time we step beyond where we'd rather be, or what we'd rather do, or what might embarrass or negatively impact us in order to share God's love, we answer this call. This is our summit. God is love. Be bold. Don't fear. Share yourself. Do love. Oh, I love that. Do love. What do you mean, do love? Share. Share yourself. This is what will sustain us in unity, strength, and the abiding love of God. God's dearly beloved people can hardly hear a first John 4 message about love without remembering that these were among, among, what were the, sorry, what were among Jesus' final words to his spiritual disciples. A new commandment I give to you, he tells his friends in John 13, 35 and 34. Love one another. By this all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. While the apostle repeatedly calls his readers to love each other, here he reminds us that our love begins with God's love. Any love that God's dearly beloved people show is rooted in and is produced by God. In fact, in verse 10, the apostle insists, this is love, not that we love God, that he loved us. In verse 19, he even goes on to assert, we love, we love because he first loved us. God, in other words, didn't respond to our love for God by loving us. In 
fact, the scriptures insist that God, dearly beloved people, weren't even interested in much less seeking God's love. God loves us first, even when we aren't naturally, particularly, I love this, are lovable. He still loves us. Yet when we sometimes confuse human love with some kind of attraction, John insists that God's love is very concrete. God, after all, showed God's love for us by sending God's one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. He loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. We might say then that God's love is visible as the word would of an angel, as audible as the cries of the band of mine. I got to tell you, I love this cross. That is the most, that is beautiful. Okay? Please take note of what that means. This is not part of my sermon. This is part of my, what I saw. I get to visit churches and see all kinds of windows and stuff, but that stuck out in my life. God's love for God's people is a feast for the senses. Yet God's love, which originates in God and is made manifest by God in turn, also echoed in God's adopted sons and daughters. Dear friends, God, John again writes in verse 11, Since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. God's love in Christ doesn't just rescue us from destruction. It provides us a model to live by by the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, John goes on to insist that while no one has seen God, if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. The apostle uses similar language in verse 1 when he insists that God love has been made more perfect among us. Here again, the apostle insists that God's love plays a central role in his people's love. Yet Jesus' followers may wonder how John can insist that God's love is made complete in us when we love each other. Let me repeat that. Made complete in us when we love each other. After all, God's love is complete on its own. Every, even God's dearly beloved people can't make it more complete or more perfect. So maybe John is saying a little more than this. When God's people love each other, God is present. I feel that today. I hope you do. God is present. The recipients of our love has also experienced God's love even more fully and completely. When, for example, we love people who have sinned against us by forgiving them, they experience God's love for them in tangible ways. So, it is as if the apostle asserts that our acts of love toward each other somehow help deepen our sense of God's love for us, God's love for us. That, in turn, adds God gives us confidence on the day of judgment. The day of judgment need confidence. Amen? Amen. Things happen to God's adopted sons and daughters that sometimes make us wonder if God really loves us. We're always tempted to respond by rummaging around, I love this, in the closets of our faith. What does that mean? Does your faith go into the closet when you're not in church? I kind of wonder about that when I read this. And obedience in search of signs of God's and knowing ongoing love for us. John's approach to our search for assurance about God's love for us is quite different. In fact, the equation offered us seems too simple to be true. Our awareness of God's love grows in us as we love our neighbor. Our confidence about a future in which God continues to love us is deepened as we do concrete by love concrete things to show each other things. So we might say that God's love for us and our love for God and each other gives us a deepened trust in God's gracious goodness. Amen. Now I'll turn it. 